Hello, welcome to part one. It's going to be fun. Part one of the Sing Tao introdu 1939 introductions, and this is entirely based on the idea of what happens if the events of January 1939 actually precipitate a war. Now, the interesting thing about these introductions is they've all been recorded in concert with Daniel Friedman, who was the person for, who was the patron who proposed this topic. And basically what we've done is we've talked through several potential scenarios. Now the first video, this video, is going to lay out things and lay out basically what happened. And then the subsequent videos are going to get into various scenarios. So, I hope you enjoy. I'm going to start this off. This is the first time I've ever done this with this software. So I'm going to disappear. But there are going to be me and Daniel talking on the screen. Hope you enjoy and thank you. In, um... And I'm just going to say, recording has started. So, I will cut out, I will, we will do a proper counting like I do with bilge pumps, but I'm just pressing the button because I don't want to get into it, get into it and talk. And literally, we did once do this with bilge pumps. We actually did a whole thing and then we went, and I was press record. Oh. Oh, poopy thing. Yes. Um, so we'll also keep it clean for now. Yeah. Um, so the Sing Tao incident, um, there's a wonderful um post about it from january 2019 written by some random uh, <laughs> academic um which is what sparked my interest in it as well um and essentially against the backdrop of the pretty horrific sino-japanese war yeah. where the japanese have been merrily committing some truly terrible atrocities. And there's also the Sino-Soviet, well, the Russo-Japanese war going on at this well at this point. Yeah. That's the so same thing. Got, you've got that happening up in the north of China. So they're not yes. only fighting the Chinese, they're also now fighting the Russians. And they're also not paying too much attention about who they bomb so, and things. So they've bombed the international legations at Shanghai. They... Uh, have sunk the USS Panay. They hmm. uh, shoot down various civilian aircraft. Um, and in one case, uh, I found a diary looking online where somebody goes, well, they, they claimed they hadn't really done anything. Yet one of our gunboats was pulling bullet riddled corpses out of a bu bullet riddled aircraft crashed in the river. And they claimed they didn't open fire because we'd seen them chasing it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Not sure what's happening there. Um, and so on the background of all of this, you've also got the tensions happening in Europe and you've got the exciting times when everyone talks about um, missed opportunities with rearmament and going to war with Germany, but actually what state is Germany in at this point um, and things like that. So that's also potential distractions. And you've just had the uh, Munich crisis in Germany, with Germany uh, taking over bits of Czechoslovakia. You've had, um, referring to my notes, you've got Italy from November 38 trying to tell France that large parts of North Africa should, for reasons, be Italian. Let's and be honest, those reasons were the Roman Empire. Yes. Um, and the French kind of went, that's nice. Um, times have changed a bit since the Roman Empire. Um, and Mussolini remained in denial of that, from what I can tell. Um, and the Spanish Civil War is still, uh, it's probably coming towards an end, but it's still pretty grim there. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lot of excitement going on in, in, in the world. Um, so... What the world really needs is a good distraction. And yeah. before we get too far, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick little introduction because you will have possibly not heard the voice that's with me before. And hello to everyone who's watching this now. This is Daniel Freeman. He has, is a, he's a very nice medical doctor, but he's also a very nice patron. And he suggested Singing Town 1939 as a what if. What if war had started? 
And I had the interesting thing, because of this as a sort of counterfactual history of the idea of why don't we do this as a discussion? And Daniel actually had the idea at the same time and actually sent me the email before I sent him the email. So we're going to be doing a series of part one. At the moment, we've got worked out to about part five, but it might grow more of discussions of uh, different scenarios of what might happen if Singtown in 1939 goes hot. Now, the Singtown incident, as you know, is all about HMS Birmingham, the SS Vincent de Paul, and a very, very plucky little sloop. And the Japanese na- uh, Japanese Coast Guard impounding a ship and the Japanese Navy basically deciding they're going to let the Royal Navy go, but pointing guns at them as they go out the harbour. Now, we're going to discuss this incident a little bit properly in the first part, and we're going to go into that, so that's why I've got some, a very quick overview. But... It is rather an interesting what if of history because it happens in January 1939. And as Daniel's just been going over, there is so much stuff already happening then that, frankly, it could have been a major tinderbox. And by rights, it should have been. And that means World War II starts eight months earlier in the Far East. Now, actually, as this happens on the 30th of January 1939, you could say it's seven months earlier because it probably won't get started much till February. But, you know, that's mere calendar. Anyway, carry on. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just thought I'd do a quick introduction there because, you know, it's nice yeah. to do it as a joint thing than me adding in an introduction, which is just me talking. So, and I'm referring to some poorly scribbled notes of mine. Um, just to give a little bit more background focusing in on quite what's been happening in and around um, sort of China, you've got the Britain and the US um, giving hefty loans to the Chinese nationalists. You've got the Mao's Chinese communists um, being supported by the Soviet Union, all of which is irritating the Japanese. However, the US is also, in particular, is the main source of things like oil, steel, the scrap metal that I'd always wondered why people cared about scrap metal. I had a quick look. It's because that's what you make bullets from and shells. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff is getting to Japan from the US. So although the US is annoying the Japanese by giving loans to Chiang Kai-shek and people, they are also merrily selling really quite a lot of uh, munitions and things to the um, to the Japanese as well. So yeah. it's and there's a degree of dependency. So it's all a little bit awkward. You've also still got a very isolationist America that. Um, yeah, it's a mess. Um, it now, wants to tell the world what to do, but it doesn't want to get involved in the world doing it. Yes, or at least there are quite a lot of them who don't. And you've got the um, you've got FDR, who I really haven't come across that many ne- criticisms and negatives about, which I always worries me. Um, He's got a very good PR machine. He does. He has a superb PR machine, and. You know, the question is really, at what point can he get himself involved in things? Um, So we've got um, there have been a few bits and pieces going on. um, And there's also still um, around the coast of China, there's still at least some of these legations and trading ports. a lot of which have got international settlements. So you not only have Britain holding Hong Kong, the French have got a little bit of China under treaty. The Portuguese have got Macau. Um, there's French Indochina, which we now know is sort of Vietnam and a lot of those sorts of places. You've got Shanghai with a big international delegation. You've got um, the port for um, Beijing, Peking, we are going to struggle with names a lot at the moment <laughs> in this talk because hey, I'm, I'm have... quite happy to let you go and try the names first. Just in, then it sort of makes my pronunciation sound slightly better. Yeah. 
So there are, and there's a difficulty that sort of we've changed the uh, way that we would tend to adjust the sort of, um, what's the right way of putting it? The, 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 the way that we transliterate the um, Chinese characters to some extent and, and how they like to have things um, pronounced. So that, it's that's... like I pronounce Sing Tao as Sing Tao because that is how the Royal Navy pronounced it in 1939. However, the modern city is called Guangdong. Yes. And so it's a very different pronoun. It, it's, it's how was it anglicized in terms of time? Some of the names, I'm going to say to because of the way I pronounce it, we might end up pronouncing them as the Royal Navy was calling them in 1939 it might not be right to compared to modern J china and japan we do apologize we're not it's not basically an insult it's just that especially for this we are trying to put ourselves in the mindset of the time and work out what might have happened because this is not sort of what if or alternative history this is what sort of counterfactual history looking at it sort of sort of how do we learn the history of what was going on in the wider world by looking at the events which almost could have happened and how that would have triggered things so it's that sort of history and historical analysis going on. Also, I drink Sing Tao beer, so I'm yeah. used to saying it, um, which does come from there and the brewery there. Yeah. Um, so what? And it was also the uh, site of a very interesting, it was originally the site of the German, one of the German colonies in China. And they had lost it in World War One when a Royal Navy and Imperial Japanese Navy and Army siege and force had taken it off them. So the um, so the other one of the other uh, stresses is Canton now Guangzhou around Hong Kong had been invaded. <clears throat> In October 38 by the Imperial Japanese Navy. Yeah. Um, which uh, basically puts um, Hong Kong very near to the front lines of a, this really quite nasty war. And there are, or there are going to be, um, some bombings of um, that where they accidentally hit Hong Kong. Yes, and um, this is the thing again, it's another reason why at this point there are a lot of people who are both clamouring for more forces to be sent for Hong Kong, but there's also a realisation in the British government that Hong Kong is not likely to survive. And I have a feeling in it's going to be an interesting topic for us looking at this potential history of what happens in that period, because even after it gets reinforced in World War, sort of after 1939 and these sort of things, it is in trouble in yes. terms of it's very quickly taken. And you've had things. I mean, just going back a little bit further, sorry about the some of the stuff, just because I have finally found the notes um, in. And I, I find this quite shocking. You have what's now known as the rape of Nanking, Nanking having been the uh, capital of the um, Chinese, the Republican Chinese, um, which goes on sort of December 37 to January 38. And th things were bad enough that it was a fine upstanding member of the Nazi party who helped to organise the um, kind of attempting to protect uh, the, um, the sort of the locals and create safe areas there. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it is a, one of those interesting scenarios where it's just so bad. Even people who are traditionally and who are considered the really quite not quite nice people actually feel that they should get involved and be nice and helpful. Yes, and I do apologize. My lunch has just arrived. No. Oh. Um, so you've got um, you've got these sorts of things and and a sort of um timely fashion wuhan had been captured in late october 38 which mm -hmm. kind of um saw the start and and you were seeing some major air raids on civilian areas in the way that you had in um uh in in the spanish civil war as well so this was this was causing a lot of um problems 
So, Interesting enough, it does cause outrage, but not quite the same attention as the Spanish Civil War gets in terms of international brigades, etc., turning up. And that might tell you something yeah. about sort of relative priorities of humanity again. But it does cause quite a lot of people to get very agitated who are out there and seeing what's going on. Yeah. So... Um... Yeah, I, it's 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 not good. I mean, the, the Soviet send eight volunteer group, which I'm sure is as much a voluntary as anything in Stalin's Russia would be, particularly just when they're purging the military and the military is there. But essentially, uh, uh, and the Japanese are kind of one uh, limited engagement in the summer of 38 against the Russians in that border at, at Lake Kassan. They kind of won and I think then withdrew with honour, feeling as though they'd kind of achieved what they set out to do. So they were kind of getting the idea that the European countries were containable and they might be outraged and they might do limited things, but actually they were pushing what diplomatically they could because the Americans were merrily selling them quite stupidly large amounts of goods. Um, and so were the British. Yeah, so were the British. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to. I think the no, website no, I took data from um, was primarily... Um, it's, it's one of the interesting things leading up to World War II yeah. is that the amount of global trade is still going on and it's one of the interesting ideas that we always haven't presented <laughs> is that as long as the world is doing as much trade as it's doing, then war won't break out because everyone's trading. And actually, when you look at it, quite a lot of power people end up going to war with their most important trading partners. Yeah. So what I've managed to scribble down, don't quite can't remember the source, but mm -hmm. I probably got it from one of Alex Alex's. Um, in 1937, 60 percent of Japan's oil came from the US, including all of their aviation fuel. Yes. And 76 percent of their aircraft was still coming from the states because they were still building up their own um, aviation industry so when you look at what so this is so anything which is now going to involve the japanese navy we do not have the zero the zero is not going to feature in this mm -hmm. fanboys relax anti-fanboys relax <laughs> um, actually even the zero's predecessor from memory is not the dominant force in the force in the fleet it would yet it would become it's they, the predecessor's predecessor from memory um which i'm just yeah. gonna have to check up because i've now forgotten the name i was had it in my so, head i'm just going to talk about it and now i've forgotten it so the predecessor was the a5m claude which was introduced yeah. in 36 but e certainly during the sino-japanese stuff they were still they were short of them and they were still having to use the predecessor plane, which was a biplane, that makes yep. the Gloucester Gladiator look sleek and advanced. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so this is kind of the international situation. You've got a lot of stuff going on. You've got a lot of distraction happening in Europe, which makes the Japanese, and and you've also got <clears throat> Britain and America and some of these other countries kind of playing both ends against the middle. They are ma making massive loans to the Chinese and they're also merrily selling huge amounts of goods to the Japanese. So there's a huge amount of trade. Yep. But there's also potentially shipping that might be carrying things that the Japanese don't want carried to places. And the SS St. Vincent de Paul is quite an interesting ship from what little I can piece together about it and that seems to be that it was re registered as French being operated by a British company in based out of Hong Kong yep and might not have told the entire truth to the Japanese Coast Guard about where it had come from and where it was going. No, it didn't. Um, so we're not going to say 
that um, things were... On the up and up? Not necessarily, no. Uh, it, was, um, <clears throat> it was a very interesting uh, formation of its things. And as I said, um, as, as I understand it, the company which owns it is registered in one country, but is technically owned by a Dutch gentleman who apparently lives in Canada, is one of the things I've... Uh, the furthest I've got and the trouble is in all my inquiries neither the Dutch nor the Canadians seem to know about this person and whether or not they existed so um yeah we really don't know huge amounts about this ship um I mean we know some things we know from the Lloyd's registers um yeah. which is what tells us that it was registered in a French Pacific Island place and that it was being leased to Jardine Matheson and company. Yeah. Um, and I think, and it was also capable of achieving not quite double digits uh, in terms of speed in knots. Yes. Um, just uh, so when it comes to the idea of running away, which will come up, um, uh, and then in my notes, I got distracted by the fire on the bottom, Richard. Um, <laughs> for some reason. Um, so we, so uh, thirty. So on the, uh, where are we? So on the twenty eighth of um, January, the Royal Navy detachment at Wei Highway, um, which had been another of these legations, Wei Highway, had been given back to the Chinese in 1930, but a small portion had been kept as a, as a base. And this was the Ford base that Alex has talked about in other podcasts, in, in other YouTube videos, um, that um, was a, you know, was, was seen as a Ford base for, for going for the um, Japanese if we needed to as part of our kind of eastern hour. I'm English, you're <laughs> English. Our, the Commonwealth's uh, and or British Empire plan for, for defending the east. Mm. So hearing, so they're in Wei Highway, which is a little bit, which is a chunk to the north. We're going to need some maps, perhaps. Um, so they are there and they are having snowball fights, according to some of the um, records and they get the call to say you need to get you know this has happened at Sing Tao which is not too far away so you know the SS St Vincent de Paul a British ship yeah um, has been we're going to call her British we'll call her British the, 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 because, yeah yeah um, a ship with which has a British interest has been taken along with a couple of Norwegians who we are not so bothered about at this stage the important thing is it's flying the British flag. Yes, it has the red duster. Mm -hmm. um, so, Birmingham and Folkestone make top speed for Sing Tao. Um, slightly hampered by the fact that Birmingham is capable of 30-something knots and Folkestone is a sloop and so capable of about 20, I believe. But interesting enough, the speed they must have been making to have got there in the time they made it. it must have been in excess of 24 knots. Oh. Oh, no. HMS Foxton lied to the Washington Tweety. I the think... Uh, <laughs> she was designed... Remember the, the phrasing of the treaty is they have to be designed not to be able to exceed a speed of 20 knots. Yes. The fact that when you pump in as much oil and you turn on all the turbochargers as you can and you fire everything up to maximum power and suddenly you take off governors off the engines, they can suddenly turn out an extra few horsepower and get you up an extra couple, a few knots, it will leave to one side. Yes, but this, this may be where the bits of Scotty in Star Trek <laughs> <laughs> This is where my point where I do love this book, but I am going to mention again, John Jordan comes to mind because in it, he does believe the British are very, very honest. And then there's me who goes and looks at the things and goes, you are right. On paper, they are incredibly honest. 
But the thing is, they're just better at not getting caught. Yes. Which anyone who has driven on British roads outside of London may know about when they've seen certainly on motorways and things and dual carriageways, speeds people drive at, what the speed limits are, and how people drive when there's a speed camera or they think there's a police car. Mm-hmm. Um, and my I car, drive a Subaru, I'm of course completely innocent of this because no one drives a Subaru to drive fast. No. No one. I, I in no way drive a car that looks distinctly boy racerish, even if when I got it an awfully long time ago. Um, I didn't get the boy racer Honda engine. I, it just looks like it should have one. It just looks like it should be a Type R. Mm. <laughs> um, it has half yeah. the horsepower. Um, yeah. I am going to just sort yeah. of mention the quick thing, because we did mention it, the Nakajima A4N, which is the Japanese carrier-based fighter we were talking about, the distinctly um, very much biplane looking aircraft, which enters uh, first flight is in 1934, is introduced into service in 1936, and is actually still in production until 1940. 221 of them end up in service in Imperial Japanese Naval Air Service. They are single-seater. Uh, they have a single engine which produces uh, between 670 to 740 horsepower, depending on the mixture and how rich the mixture is put into it. Just remember this, uh, most aircraft in this period have variable, you can vary the strength of the mixture going in, you can enrich the mixture, um, which is kind of an interesting thing for you when you're thinking about your controlling uh, your petrol and the, the elements of an aircraft. It's a, it is a fun scenario, thinking of a pilot managing to do that. And it has two forward firing 7.7 millimeter machine guns, and we all know how great the 7.7 millimeter machine gun is in Japanese service. So that is their principal carrier-based fighter at the moment. That's the Type 95 carrier-based fighter. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm still trying to hunt down what the um, Allied designation of that particular aircraft is. It seems to be, there seems to be about four different ones going round. So I'm trying to find out what the official one is versus the unofficial one. Because some of them do appear to end up in World War II. Um mm. Not that they have a nice time in World War Two. Yeah, Bi- biplanes, with the exception of um, the swordfish, generally don't. No, and let's be honest, the swordfish is a little bit freaky. The swordfish is freaky. The swordfish is gorgeous and wonderful, but freaky. That is. Uh, so we have we have the Saint Vincent Paul, the. She's been seized. She's sitting in Sing Tao Harbour. Um, there are three Japanese heavy cruisers of the mm-hmm. Miyoku, Miyoku class. class. Mm-hmm. Um, Headed by Ashikara. Yep. So basically Miyoku isn't there and it's the other three. Mm-hmm. And they each have five twin 8 inch or 200 millimeter guns. Um, if you want to have a real party, you have a lot of 8-inch guns there. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind that the RN is sending a, okay, really nifty town-class cruiser, which will have 12 6-inch guns and mm-hmm. some torpedoes. The Japanese obviously have torpedoes as well. Um, in fact, they have 12 torpedo tubes on each of their cruisers, I think, or I might have... But- uh, I might be wrong on that one, actually. Um, I think you are r- uh, roughly right. That is what yeah. most of them have, but they have mod- been modifying them, so some have less. And yeah. there is debate as to exactly when they were modified and when they lose these things, because some pictures seem to suggest if those pictures stated correctly, they have them after they're theoretically supposed to have lost them. But, yeah. you know, we'll leave that to one side. Mm. I mean, That's a debate be... for another day. Yeah. Um, so... And, and there's also the sloop, which has three or four four-inch guns and no torpedoes. Um, um, I think from memory, HMS Folkestone has, is literally, she's in her full peacetime present sloop outfit, which means she has one, a single four-inch gun forward 
and nothing else mounted other than machine guns. Okay, so so talk- she is very very lightly armed. Yeah. Um, the key point about her is she is a hull flying the white ensign. Yes, and that should never be understated in all of these things because it means that sinking her is going to be an act of war. And the whole point of bringing her is it means you can put a ship either side of the Vince in the pool. That's the point. And I would also argue that and think that you can get away with an accident and an incident with one ship, particularly if there's very few to no senior officer survivors. Yeah. But two ships, chances of that happening really aren't going to be high. So you, you can claim an accident if you, uh, you know, but yeah, it's yeah. not good. It's it's not going to be it's not going to go down well because two British ships are not going to randomly sink um, after an interesting encounter with two Japanese crew with three Japanese cruisers that somehow need more ammunition. The Japanese are mm-hmm. not going to claim that. No. So, and you have to remember there is a lot of diplomatic presence around Sing Tao. It still has a major German consul uh, consular office in. It has a major interna- lots of international delegations in. And it has a British consular office in, which I am still trucking down the details of because it turns out all the foreign office records for that have, strange enough, not survived in National Archives. What's really annoying is the index for them has survived. Oh, did you? So the index has been kept. So you get but to know- I have spent days in National Archives. I know what was there. But the folders which actually had the records no longer exist. They haven't been preserved. Oh. So uh, my entire pinning on my hopes is to try and, is to try and get a um, fellowship to Oxford, one of those visiting fellowships, which I'm currently campaigning of at All Souls College, Oxford. Come on, All Souls College, you know, come on. Mm-hmm. Do It'd it. It'd be very nice because uh, the reason I want that is because all of them are uh, the, the quite a lot of the senior people from there, uh, from the uh, uh, Foreign Office, were Oxford graduates, and their papers have gone and been stored in the Bodleian. But I have a feeling that a few day visits are not going to be enough for me to try and figure out what they were up to and what was going on there. And there is a lot that seems to be going on because at one point there's a mention of that Vincent de Paul might have been carrying British diplomatic papers. And I'm wondering why. And I'm wondering if she was perhaps being used as a back channel to talk between the British government and the nationalist forces. Mm. We don't know, though. And uh, that could be completely that could be completely innocent. It could be nothing. It could be a uh, standard diplomatic communique was going back and she was just a merchant ship used to carry it because she had a British flag. There are all sorts of options for why it was uh, it was uh, she might have been carrying stuff. But either way that are very innocuous and nothing at all weird or special or fancy. And it's not, it's most likely one of those, but the trouble is I cannot find documents to look at. So I need to go and search somewhere to find them. Yeah. The, so they arrived there. We are a, just to give a context, we're a bit to the North. We're, it's, it's pretty much slap bang between Shanghai and Beijing. Yes is the other thing about Sing Tao, now Qing Dao. Qing Dao? I have no idea how to pronounce it. Um, uh, and so we, so lots of diplomatic stuff going on, lots of uh, trade. It's a big city. It's... Um, it's still a major military facility to this day. Yeah. And the... the um, uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at, we're talking about sort of quite a big and important place. It's not a random. No. Um, and so the St. Vincent de Paul appears with, um, you know, and is, is kind of sitting there um, whilst people do things. And as we say, we're not sure which console is at Sing Tao. Um, and we have the captain of HMS Birmingham, um, mm-hmm. Eric Brind, known as Daddy Brind, apparently, to his men, mm-hmm. who is who has spent quite a lot of his career out in um, the China Station, and so have quite a lot of his crew and quite a lot of his 
um, you know, chief petty officers and junior officers are actually um, able to speak Chinese and Japanese yeah. and understand they have, things. They have spent, it, this is part of the reason of good, the advantage of having presence force around the world. You do get end up being very interconnected with the local population. You do end up building these sort of relationships and this information, which means he has quite a few officers options for sending for diplomatic things and he does send he sends a couple of different lieutenants lieutenants ashore to try and do some diplomacy to talk with the local consul he considers going ashore himself at one point but then decides it's better to stay aboard his ship to coordinate things because it is quite so tense and because he is positioned as it is in the harbour he has positioned Birmingham literally between the SS Vincent in the pool and the free Japanese cruisers. And the Japanese cruisers are positioned in a line. And they're actually positioned on the seaward side of how to get out. So to go out, you have to go past them. Birmingham has come in to the thing and is between them and Vincent the pool. And then there is HMS Folkestone has come even further and is sitting inside. Of that, and actually, there's another good advantage of bringing a sloop for this because they weren't sure how deep the water was going to be there if they had to do on the inside. And a sloop, of course, is far shallower draft than a cruiser is. And who knows if another another cruiser it, sending in two cruisers would have been very, very confrontational. As much as you might like the second cruiser, it would have been very, very confrontational. Whereas you're sending in a cruiser, that status, that says, look, we're taking this seriously, we've sent a big ship. But we send in a second ship as well to secure both sides, we send in a sloop. And in the nicest way, you, you've got three cruisers. How can you take offence or consider a sloop a threat? You know, that sort of thing. It's kind of calling your bluff, because if you react strongly to the second ship's presence, you look like not only an... an a you look like a very bad and very paranoid person and you look like you've got something to hide if that second ship is quite so small. Yeah. And it's kind of like in the modern naval terms, if you're deploying a frigate into a center and you send a river class OPV with it, because if someone then goes, Oh, we are Egyptian sending two ships. You can go, well, yes, we've sent a frigate, but the second ship is there is just, you know, to show us our sincerity of our, you know, efforts here. And it's a river class OPV. Why are you upset with a river class turning up? And that is what is literally the HMS Folkestone is. HMS Folkestone is the almost the litmus test, because how do you react to the second some uh, second ship turning up? Mm. If you one ship turning up is one thing, a task force turning up, which is what any more than one ship turning up is, is another thing. But how do you choose to play it? Do you choose to ignore the fact there's a second ship there because it's so small, so you pretend you can't see it, in which case you're probably not gunning for a fight? Or do you focus on it and start incessantly talking about how the Royal Navy has brought two ships to fight you? Mm. And also, are you going to look good on the world stage if it takes three cruisers, three heavy cruisers, mm. to take on one British light cruiser and a sloop. Yes, and, uh, and the Royal Some... Navy then has the advantage of saying you had to use a heavy cruiser to sink a sloop. Yes. So negotiations are going on on the 30th. Uh, and you could also no, guarantee that HMS Folkestone's crew would get entirely swept with Victoria Crosses for that. Yes. Because let's uh, be honest, that, that, that's, that is conspicuous bravery in, front, in the face of the enemy. <laughs> Honestly, I think they deserve a Victoria Cross for turning their four-inch gun to face the Germany. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, I have to say, what, um, what surprises me is the fact that I'm not surprised at the idea that the RN, this little, little ship, is turning up and joining in like this. <laughs> I'm actually not surprised. I kind of expect it of the Royal Navy. And that says something about how we still view them, or maybe at least how I still view them. But the, um, the, the, the situation is that the, the, they spend I, the 29th, I think, of January 
talking, mm-hmm. um, talking quite a lot. Um, things have slowed down. It's a Sunday. Um, the Japanese are dragging things out, claiming people aren't available. Um, there are difficulties that there isn't actually a direct link, apparently. Um, and I'm assuming Alex is going to agree with this because I'm literally reading it off his article. <laughs> You know, so there isn't a radio link or anything between the ships and the shore yeah. um, that's working. So they're having to go back and forth by little boat um, to do these things. And it gets particularly difficult after dark. Um, and getting frustrated, and I think it's, you know, and, and um, not inappropriately frustrated. Uh, Brind declares at kind of the end of the day, we're leaving at eight o'clock tomorrow. Bang. Just mm-hmm. says it. Now he has presumably sent this message via a small boat because he's staying mm-hmm. on 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 his ship. And so simultaneously he dispatches another small boat with midshipman Edward Ashmore, Bloomington Japanese, nineteen, okay, young, but father is an admiral. Father is a captain as well, will go on to become an admiral. Grandfather is an admiral. Um, uncle will become an admiral. Brother will also become an admiral. Son, I think, also becomes an admiral. Um, it is a, it is enabled, and I'm fairly sure they're actually they've got generations serving in the Royal Navy to this day. Yeah. And he learnt, and he'd been out there for a year. We mm-hmm. just checked the um, naval records. Um, they literally list every officer on the ships plus he has a very good book and he ends up yeah. being he and he goes on to become first sea lord and is the guy who gets the through deck cruisers through he so that tells you what ki- <laughs> that tells you what kind of mind you're dealing with even at a young age he has a very he's well versed in the royal navy politics and royal navy in the far east because his father is also, like Brind, is a career officer who has served a lot of time in the Far East and has taken his family with him, which is why Edward has the linguistic knowledge he does already and is quite so capable as he is because of the scenario he's, he's been in. He's grown up going out to the Far East with his father. He knows the scenario. And this might well affect partially his selection, although Bryn does actually have quite a few young officers he could have picked from. And technically, you would presume, potentially, a lieutenant would be sent. But again, sending a midshipman is kind of like, it's the, net, it's the officer version of sending the sloop. How can you be annoyed by a midshipman's party? It is the, literally the smallest unit a Royal Navy, force, a Royal Navy captain can dispatch. Mm. And the crucial thing, and Ashmore um, plays up to this, is he goes on board and prevents the Japanese from boarding when they get grumpy and send a boarding party because he goes, terribly sorry, can't let you on board, go and talk to my captain. I was thinking about this and realised when I was 18, 19, I was, I knew just how to be that degree of obstructive politeness from my days at school. Mm-hmm. And I imagine that he's at the same point where he knows exactly what to say and do because he's using his own position of weakness effectively. He is yeah. using the fact that he's not a, you know, uh, not senior, not a decision maker, really. He's an officer in training. He has a white tab instead of gold rings. I think, I don't know if he'd have even been commissioned at this. Were they commissioned as um... warrant officers? They, they are commissioned to an. They are commissioned, yes, mm. as I understand. They're commissioned, but they're not. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a nebulous commissioning, in that technically he's in charge of the chief petty officer who's with him, but that's the sort of technical. Uh, technically, like in the army, a sub lieutenant technically outranks a sergeant major. Yeah. Uh, no, no, oh, it's not a sub lieutenant. It's what is the, the rank of the <laughs> army? Technically, outranks a sergeant major. Unless but you're in the cavalry, 
it's a, it's a very, it, but of course, it's a very, very um, silly second lieutenant who actually tries to tell the sergeant major what to do. Mm. Um, oh, we're also ignoring the fact that there were also, there was also a significant detachment of Marines on board the Birmingham. Yes, there's a significant detachment of Marines, and it's also a significant detachment of, um, oh, which is it? One of the regiments from, that's at Singapore. They also have a detachment of 60 of them aboard. So they have about, probably in the region of, uh, it's probably about 120, 120 troops who would, uh, people who'd be called ground troops, ground forces aboard. But remember, the Marines do man one of the turrets as well. Yeah. So they're probably in that duty run. And consistently, no Marines have been sent ac across the events in the pool. Yeah. They've used sailors. They've sent a detachment of... Ooh, from memory, I should probably get this up. I think he's got six sailors and a chief petty officer with him, hasn't he? Or... Something like that, yeah. It's it's a tiddly uh, detachment. I mean, it's it's really a... It's a diplomatic speed bump, is what yeah. they are. Um, it's a tripwire force. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's a tiny, tiny force. Hmm. So, um, they uh, that you know things are not able to progress overnight because boats are struggling in the dark in a big, busy harbour. Um, and there's no radio communication directed between, say, the British consulate. Four, it was actually four ratings, a petty officer and a midshipman himself. So it's a, the whole party is six personnel. I, I thought it was eight, but I was adding two more on. Um, and it's, you know, it's that's really, really tiny. Think about that. That's six people to hold a ship. Yeah. And so he does it by pulling up the gangway and all sorts of things. Mm. Making it difficult to board. Yeah. So at eight o'clock. As planned, the SS St. Vincent de Paul gets up steam and leaves, accompanied by Birmingham and um, I suddenly can't remember the name of the... Uh, Folkestone. Folkestone, sorry. Um, <laughs> Folkestone goes first, has to sail past the cruisers, the uh, Japanese cruisers first, Vincent de Paul slots in behind her, and then Birmingham comes up the rear yeah so they're sailing and they might be achieving the uh maximum speed of the st vincent de paul which is only a 1295 gross registered ton um according to the um she is a very small merchant ship and she's very old and very slow yeah she was built in 1919 mm -hmm. um she they they depart. Now the the interest in the speed is partly to do with this is where we depart from. Because in uh, the, what happens in history is the Japanese or, or the heavy cruisers swing their guns out and point them towards HMS Birmingham, and HMS Birmingham swings her guns round and points them at the bridges of each of the. Japanese, free Japanese heavy cruisers, and also at the Japanese land headquarters for the Navy. And HMS Folkestone also swings her four inch gun around, and I'm told points it at Ashigara, the flagship. I'm not quite sure what she thought her four inch gun would achieve, but she's HMS Folkestone, she's part of the Royal Navy, and if there is going to be a fight, she's going to fire. Um, honestly, if she cracked on speed and got there, out of there i'd have understood that one but she of course doesn't um and in this is in history this happens they get out the sea and nothing else happens uh, basically the japanese decide that it's over that they're not going to follow it up on it and even the pointing of the guns at the cruisers is to an extent how to put it is played down by the royal navy and it's one of the things when you read ashmore's account because of his position in the ship, he doesn't really sort of pick up on this, and he only thinks it's one. He thinks it's one of the cruisers, maybe pointing guns, but he can only see them from the position he's in. And when you read Brin's account, Noble's account, Admiral Noble being the CNC of the Pacific of the China Station, 
at this time. That's when you realize that it's all three of the cruisers pointing their guns. And what is picked up on very much is that this is what the Japanese are doing. But if the Royal Navy had hesitated or fired, it could have definitely been World War II. And if the same as the Japanese had been fired, it would have been World War II. So this is one of those moments where they are literally pointing guns at each other. Um, this is a, uh, how do I put this, Checkpoint Charlie moment from the Cold War. This is one of those moments where the world's time sort of thickens because of so many potentialities coming out of it. But what we're saying, and what we've decided our point of, of change will be, is they will have got out. So yeah. we've kept this history at this point. And so, now Daniel's going to introduce yeah. the next, the, point, the starting point for what will be our scenarios. Yes. So the plan for Birmingham and Folkestone is that they are, and this is, from what I can tell, historical, they are uh, going to escort the St. Vincent de Paul to uh, the mouth of the Yangtze River, which is to about 270 nautical miles or 500 kilometers away. So that's going to take them about 30, 36 hours, assuming that the St. Vincent de Paul is going at a, something approaching its top speed. Um, now, my conjecture is that there is tension within the Japanese um, uh, what's the right way of putting it? Within Japanese, pol there's politics within their military mm. and within their civilian side. And the Navy, for the most part, kind of doesn't want a war. The Army is a lot more gung ho and uh, fighty at this stage. And arguably because the Army thinks they're winning and containing the Europeans, whereas the Japanese Navy are regularly coming up against the Royal Navy, the French Navy, the American Navy, and are therefore have a far more accurate image of what they're going to be really facing, whereas the army, let's be honest, hasn't been facing major detachments mm. of the forces. Yeah. Now, the, the other issue that the Japanese have got is that Sing Tao is in the northern sector that is dominated by some element, elements of the Japanese army that are probably more likely to be even more fighty. So what I conjecture is that the imperial, the local sort of, some local general, and I haven't got round to working out a name because it doesn't really matter because this is all made up, mm -hmm. tell anyone, um, says to the Japanese admiral on the Ashigara, you have allowed us to be dishonored should not have done this which is the killer phrase in japanese culture yes. at this point yeah you know this is this is not good so the japanese ships with their top speed of an awful lot more than eight or nine knots which i again i i mean you can look it up on wikipedia it doesn't really matter it's a lot faster they're going to be able to catch up in one of those things that's one of those maths problems that i was never any good at at school but they'll catch up fairly soon, but probably out of sight of the shore. Yes. And they know where this little tiny British convoy is going as well. They know where they're going. It's heading to Shanghai. Yeah. So, you know, this has been announced. And part of the point is that the British are saying, no, this ship is innocent and should just have been allowed free passage. And that's where we're going. So they're sailing. If you have a problem, take it up with the uh, court, the Admiralty Court in Shanghai, where we will lodge this all, which yeah. is where it should be. According to the British, the British are very much going, the official policy is when you have a problem with a British flagship, you log it with the local Admiralty Court, which would have been Shanghai. You don't take matters into your own hands, because that's an affront to the flag of Brit uh, the British flag. That's suggesting that we don't have the ability to enforce on our own merchant ships the requirements they're supposed to be doing. Interesting enough, the Admiralty Court would have jude in favour of the Japanese that the uh, that the Vincent de Call hadn't properly flagged where it was going, yeah. and therefore they were fired. Uh, therefore, they were fined to lodge a complaint. However, it would go forward that they were illegal in their seizure of the vessel because they do not have the rights to because of the agreements and treaties of the situation, as it isn't recognised as Japanese territorial waters. It is international waters. Therefore, you log it with the Admiralty Court of the nation the ship flies the flag of. 
this feels like it's one of those situations where the police arrest somebody but get the caution wrong or in the states the Miranda rights wrong and so they have to let the person off and the fact that they found the bloody knife in their hand <laughs> it, it's one of those scenarios yeah. where the crime was committed in international waters so therefore the police can't re- the police if the let's put it this way, nice way if you were let's say an American person and you committed murder on the international in international waters on a different in different flag vessel and either the Americans or the British police tried to arrest you, it would be an illegal arrest. They should have to hand you straight over to the court that was uh, that is responsible for the flag. Yeah. And this that is, vessel. Yeah. Is that, this is also is, partly the issue and because this this sort of rule still applies today. This yeah. is the issue with the ships picking up migrants um, in the Mediterranean or crossing the Channel, that as soon as they make it onto something like a British ship, they're on British territory. Ground. It's, you know, it counts as bits, little floating bits of Britain. So, and, and it's, it's the just, problem with it's the uh, it's the same issue which is happening in the Straits of Hormuz when the Iranians decide to take ships, uh, ho- uh, take ships hostage. It's that's part of the issue you're getting into, because the whole point is, if it's in international waters, technically you have to take it up with, if you don't like what they're doing, with the Admiralty Court or equivalent. At the moment, there isn't an Admiralty Court in session. It's been passed over to parts of the courts of the United Kingdom. I think the Supreme Court and the various other courts can deal with it. Uh, Yeah, it's the I actually looked this up the other day. It's part of the high courts. of England and Wales um, remit at the moment, but it yeah. can if they if you don't like it, you can then appeal to the Supreme Court. So it's got yeah. those two levels for you to go to, which is as it's always has been. It, if there was an Admiralty Court set up in place, it would go to the Admiralty Court first, and then if you didn't like it, it could go to the UK to the High Court, and then to the Law Lords, um, theoretically. But it rarely did, because honestly, Admiralty Courts were considered some of the fairest in the world, and often nations would actually use them to resolve disputes between, as a third-party dispute resolver system. They were the international mediators of choice. Yeah. So, what we have happening now is three pretty hefty Japanese cruisers putting on all speed, racing after our little British convoy, and what I think they would do is come in, swing close in, and then I've said Ashigara launches a volley of maybe three of their torpedoes. These are going to be the ones that are called Long Lance, because that yep. seems to be the main type of torpedo the Japanese have at this point. They've got a few destroyers floating around with 21-inch, but they're mostly these 24-inch massive torpedoes launches three into the St. Vincent de Paul and then they peel off and sweep away. They are not going to hang around. They're not going to shoot at the Royal Navy because that would be an act of war. But Mm -hmm. what they're doing is stopping a ship that has left their custody against their wishes. So it's a limited action. It's this idea of it's an action. It shows resolve. It's decisive. But they're going to be saying, we haven't sunk anything flying a white ensign. Yeah. So that's my conjecture. And they're going to peel away. And they're going to... Technically, dedicate... it's flying a red ensign, but we'll leave that... Uh, yeah. But they're, they're, they do claim it's not saying it's flying a white ensign. Now, this could, of course, happen because by leaving at 8 a.m. in the morning, it's still daylight. Yeah. And this is pre-radar, even for the Royal Navy at this time. So although the Royal Navy is actually starting to get radar into ships in 1939, this period, it is starting to... It's starting to come through. Um, later in the year, uh, some of Admiral Somerville will be brought out of retirement to accelerate radar going into the naval for, into the naval service. But at this time, the Royal Navy doesn't have radar, and the Japanese don't. So if they got, to, if they had, if they wait for too long, and it gets to night time, then they're probably not going to find even that little convoy going along. Because in night it'll just disappear. So it's got to be within daylight, which means they have to crack on speed. So this is our criteria. They have yep. cracked on speed and they've gone. And now we're going to end part one here because part one is introduced. And then part two, the next ones are going to be us introducing the various scenarios. 
Mm-hmm. So that is part one done at the 59 minute scenario. So hope you've all enjoyed this. Mm. And I'm going to now wave my hand. And when, I, you, when you next see the hand waving, it's going to be hello for part two. Yes. <laughs>